it was funny, last week Charlie kind of shared that it was a little bit difficult getting a word for the week, that it was a little bit of a, of a, of a, a walk. And uh, this week I didn't, I didn't have that difficulty. I didn't receive anything till late on, or not late, but early on Saturday. But it was weird this week, whenever I thought about it, I was just had this reassurance and this peace um, that he would, he would bring a word. And so the, it happened, it happened on Saturday. And um, I was reading in my Bible, because that's a good place for inspiration, reading in your word. And uh, I was reading in Luke, and I got to Luke 20, and there's this story um, where Jesus um, is actually um, asking the uh, Pharisees, he's, he's talking to the Pharisees, and he's, he kind of confronts them a little bit. Because the Pharisees kept on trying to trip Jesus up. They kept on posing questions and, and trying to get him. And uh, so on one day, it, if you read, in, if you start in Luke 20, uh, verse 1, one of, one of the days while he was teaching the people in the temple and preaching the Gospels, the chief priests and scribes with the elders confronted him. And they spoke, saying to him, Tell us what, by what authority you are doing these things, or who is the one who gave you this authority? And Jesus answered them, I will also ask you a question, and you tell me. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from men? And they reasoned among themselves, saying, If from heaven, he will say, Why did you not believe him? But if we say from men, all the people will stone us to death, for they are convinced that John was a prophet. So they answered that they did not know where it came from. And Jesus said to them, Nor will I tell you by what authority I do these things. What I think is very interesting about that, and then further down in the chapter as well is, um, or in the next chapter, I believe. Oh, no, no. Further down in this chapter is also where um, they try and trip him up with tax. Because the, the thing that, and I shared this the last time I spoke, um, Jesus warned his disciples about the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of um, Pontius, Pilate. And that that's the, the spirit of religion, and it's also the spirit of, of the political spirit. And if you read the, the, the Gospels, it's very interesting the ways that he was attacked by the elders. They attacked him both through the, the religious spirit. Um, they tried to get his disciples. You know, once they saw his disciples picking um, some wheat during the Sabbath and said, oh, they're working on the Sabbath. And another time like this, where they asked, where do you get this authority? And, and he, he kind of confounded them with a question. And you could see it's that they were, they were dealing with this political religious spirit because they reasoned among themselves, if we say this, then, then we lose. If we say this, then we lose. So we won't say anything. Very political. I won't, say, I won't have a stance because I, I'll lose if I do that. Um, and then further down in the chapter, they ask him about, uh, they ask him about tie, uh, uh, taxing. And, it, and so verse 19, they say, The scribes and the chief priests tried to lay their hands on him that very hour, and they feared the people, for they understood he spoke this parable against them. We'll talk about that parable in a sec. So they watched him and sent spies who pretended to be righteous in order that they may catch him in some statement so they could deliver him to the rule and authority of the governor. So they started trying to trip him up, and they started asking him questions. They said, Teacher, we know that you speak and teach correctly, and you are not partial to any, but teach the way of God and truth. Is it lawful for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? So they tried to trip him up, and, but he knew what was going on. He said, Show me a Daenerys. Whose likeness and inscription does it have? And they said, Caesar's. And he said, Then render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God. And they were unable to catch him in a, in a saying in the presence of the people, and being amazed at his answer, they became silent. I just want to tag back to my last message, and specifically the part of my last message, and I spoke more on it in the second service if you haven't watched that or, or listened to it. I encourage you to listen to it, because um, I spoke more about the religious spirit and the political spirit in second service, but it still is very important, and it's still on my heart heavily that we need to be aware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of Pilate. We need to be aware of the places that we've made agreement with the religious spirit and we've made agreement with the political spirit um, because it starts to affect us. It starts to um, determine and, and interfere how we listen and how we hear from God and it interferes how we can be led by God. Um, and I just love the fact that if you look 
it makes sense that Jesus warned his disciples because throughout the Gospels, throughout his ministry, that was the chief way that they tried to stop him in, uh, until they finally succeeded in stopping him um, by arresting him and, and nailing him to a cross. They tried to trip him up. They tried to say he broke religious law, and when that didn't work, they tried to get him to somehow implicate himself and make him an enemy of the state. Um, this is what the, the religious spirit and the political spirit does. They don't hear the truth of God. They just hear somebody disagreeing with them. And instead of taking it to the Lord, they, they start, if they're partnering with the spirit, they start trying to get you to stumble so they can invalidate what you're saying. And this isn't pointed at anybody or anything, me or anybody. It's the warning of the church, I feel, for this season to be careful that when things come up, we don't shirk away from it because we initially have a disagreement. And we need to start realizing where our disagreements come from. I have disagreements with everybody. Everybody. Nobody, yeah, it's hard to believe. I have disagreements with everybody. Nobody believes exactly what I believe. If I could just find someone that had every agreement that I had, there'd be no problems. But disagreement doesn't mean disfellowship. It doesn't mean breaking relationship. I learned this the hard way because throughout my life, when I disagreed with somebody, it was, oh, I can't be their friend. Oh, I can't, you know, I can't hang out with them because they believe this. And I realized that's real silly and it's real limiting in my life. But, and it's real limiting in a place where we're supposed to be a family and we're supposed to have unity because it's, it means that I, I break away from family and I, I break unity. And it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. And so this was on my heart this week. And I was praying and I was asking the Lord and I was seeking the Lord about the areas in my life that I still am partnering with these spirits. Because it's, it's everywhere. No one's perfect from it. Everyone, if you have an opinion, you have an ability to partner with the spirit, a religious spirit and a political spirit, because they operate on agreement. They operate on agreement. Uh, they in, interact in different spheres. One is an agreement and like from in a church setting or religious setting and one is agreement in a social setting but it's all agreement and when you break agreement that's when that spirit jumps in to say now you can no longer be family and so i was asking the lord like what is what is what is the next step what is the remedy to this how do we start um, breaking this in our lives and again i was reading in luke and uh right after right after the Pharisees asked Jesus about um, by what authority do you do, do you teach and by what authority do you perform these miracles? Right after that conversation, he leapt into a parable, the parable of the vine growers. And he said, a man planted a vineyard and rented it out to vine growers and went on a journey for a long time. At the harvest time, he sent a slave to the vine growers so that they would give him some of the produce of the vineyard. But the vine growers beat him and sent him away empty-handed. And he proceeded to send another slave, and they beat him and also treated him shamefully and sent him away empty-handed. And he proceeded to send a third, and this one also they wounded and cast out. The owner of the vineyard said, What shall I do? I shall send my beloved son. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the vine growers saw him, they reasoned with one another, saying, This is the heir. Let us kill him so that the inheritance is ours. So they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and destroy those vine growers and will give the vineyard to others. When they heard it, they said, May it never be. But Jesus looked at him and said, what then, is, uh, what then is this that is written? The stone which the builders rejected, this became the chief cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces. But on whomever it falls, it will scatter them into dust. And I actually mentioned this two weeks ago in my message, that Jesus is a cornerstone, and we need to fall on him and be broken. And if we don't, he'll fall on us, and we'll be crushed. And I said, oh, we need to be broken. We need to be broken. And so it's interesting, um, he says this twice in the Gospels, he says the exact, this is one of the really cool times where the, uh, the Gospels each, when there's 
um, the same story in, in Gospels, a lot of times the wording changes. This is one of the word-for-word -word quotes, so you can be sure Jesus said this 100%. It's the same exact verse in Matthew 21, 44. Uh, whomever, uh, everyone that falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, but on whomever it falls, it will scatter them to dust. And so I was just praying, Lord, Lord, how do, how do we get broken beyond just I fall on Jesus, I submit to Jesus? How do we get broken? And, and he, he sent me to a very common, a very well-known verse. And I think I just stole Lori's verse as she told Charlie, and I think I'm about to steal one of Charlie's verses. Psalms 51.17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise these. And it's really interesting there. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart. Well, the Hebrew word for spirit there is actually ruach. It, it, it is the breath when it says that Jesus, uh, when it says that God breathed life uh, when he was making man, when he was making man, it said he bre he breathed he ruarked life and ruach ruach. I don't, I'm not a I'm not a Hebrew pronunciationist, and I just created a new word pronunciationist. Um, so, but he breathed it. That's the same word, and it means breath. It means spirit. But when it was referring to men, it actually refers to a man's emotions. A lot of times in the Hebrew, it it refers to the 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 place of emotion, and so it says a broken spirit. And the word broken there literally means to break. It's the word where if I was to break in a horse, it's that same word. And so the first part of that is, and it's the first part of it is a broken spirit. So it's my emotions, my desires, my wants are broken before God, which means they're tamed. A broken and contrite heart. Again, that word heart is actually, in Hebrew, it's, it's, that's where it talks about the place of the mind and of the will. So in Hebrew, that, the word heart is leb. And so when it refers to heart like that, it's, it's, it's where we might think our emotions. For the Hebrew mind, it actually meant the place of the mind, and it meant the place of the will. And so the first sacrifice is a broken spirit. It's, it's, a, it's a, my emotions and my desires submitted to God. And the second one is a broken and contrite heart. My mind and my will, meaning what I put my attention on, broken before God. And, and in that verse, broken is the, same, is the same word as broken spirit. So that word broken means broken as in breaking a horse or a wild animal, taming or training an animal. Uh, to, to someone else's will, to your will, that's broken. And the contrite there means submitted. So the sacrifices are a broken spirit, a, a spirit that is tame and willing and, and able to be led, no longer wild, and a broken, meaning no longer wild, a tamed and a submitted mind and will. So he, he captures it all. And I love it where it says this is the sacrifice. This is a sacrifice. So it's, it's something we have to intentionally give up. So when it, when it says fall, you know, fall on the cornerstone and be broken, by the way, that same word broken, um, it literally means to submit myself to God, submit my desires, submit my, de uh, my emotions, submit my mind, my thoughts, submit my will, my intention, Submit it to God. And let Him lead me. And as I was praying about this and as I was reading this and really feeling the Lord stirring, I just heard Him say, I want, I need the church to be sweetly broken. And I, and I feel like this next step as we're kind of entering this phase in our church, as we're entering this phase in a lot of our lives personally, I, with this COVID, with Black Lives Matter, with, with um, everything going on, the election coming up, will schools open, will schools not, everything, our personal businesses, our personal work, all of this, everything going on here, it's entering this place to become sweetly broken to the Lord. And, and sweetly broken doesn't mean there isn't a sacrifice or there isn't discomfort. In fact, a lot of times, a sacrifice makes, it is a sacrifice because it's uncomfortable. 
It's a sacrifice because there's a little bit of hurt in it. And that's what, that's what makes it a sacrifice. And so I'm not saying sweetly broken means it'll be easy and it'll be nice feeling. There, there might be discomfort. There, there has to be discomfort because it's areas where we have resistance. And the way you break down resistance, the Lord is merciful. He can do it swift and sudden, a clean break, like tearing off a band-aid, but he's also merciful where he can do it slow, like water wearing away at a rock. But it's still breaking resistance, and, I, and we'll feel that. I think a lot of us are feeling that. I, I was, I've had conversations with, with various people the last two weeks, and one of the words that keeps on coming up is we have, we're experiencing in a lot of areas of our lives, we're experiencing cognitive dissonance, which is that we understand there's something that we don't understand, but we don't know what it is. And that can be a really uncomfortable place. That can be an, a really uncomfortable um, time and season to be in when you have that cognitive dissonance and God is revealing what we don't know. And there's that uncomfortableness where we have to then submit our right to our opinion. We have to submit our right to um, our response. And then the Lord will teach us, here's what you don't know and here's how you respond to it. But that's that, that's that as Charlie spoke years ago, famous sermon of Charlie's, that's that sand in the gears sometimes. That we know and it's working, but there's some grinding and it can be uncomfortable. And so it, to, to me, it isn't that God is punishing us. And, and I, I use this analogy. Think of a horse that needs to be broken so it's ridden, so you can ride it and it can be, um, you can lead it. That horse isn't bad. God doesn't look at us and go, you're bad. He doesn't go, there's this air of resistance. You deserve to be punished or you're bad. He, you're unrighteous. That isn't the case. The horse is wild and so much of our lives and so much of my life and is I'm wild. I'm wild. And, the, and God is just coming and he's wanting to tame me and he's wanting to break me and lead me where he, where he wants me to go. And the beautiful part is lead me where I want to go. Um, so it's not, that, it's not that the horse is evil. It's not that the horse is is a bad horse. The horse is just wild, and I, I don't think any animal trainer looks at the animal they're training and thinks you're a bad animal. They look at the animal and go, you're a wild animal, and for your safety and my safety and the safety of others, you need to be tamed. And I, God looks at us the same way. I, I think I, we need to break this idea that he's this angry God that looks at us with anger. I think he's this loving God that looks at us with sadness and says, you're wild, and I want to help. I want to bring you back in. I want to tame you. <laughs> And it's really funny because I've had this revelation and then the Lord is showing me commands and it's hard. It's hard. So I'm having this realization I need to be broken and submitted before, before the Lord. And how is he showing this to me? He's saying, hey, you know that thing that you thought was a good idea or that thing that you thought you should do when somebody earns it? Actually, that's a command. And it doesn't matter if they earn it or not. If you are my child, you're commanded to have this response. And I just started going, oh, no. And, you know, there's some pretty big commands. And, and I love the Bible's awesome. Read your Bible. Read your Bible. The Bible's amazing. Um, it's not as black and white as we like to say it is. There's a whole bunch of, of gray. One of my favorite um, parts of the Bible is in Corinthians when Peter, Peter, wow, when Paul is talking about that, that there is actually conviction, and the conviction of God is personal to everybody, which means there's some things that I cannot do because I'm convicted by the Lord. It's a sin for me, but you might be able to do because you don't have that conviction. There's room for gray, and what I mean by gray is not nobody knows. Gray means it might be one thing for you and one thing for another when I'm talking about it in the Bible, but there's also black and white. It has Black, white, and gray. So we need to read the Bible so we start being able to discern and, and take from it the things that are for everybody, the things that are for, for just you individually. So read your Bible, and I think some of us are going to be surprised by the number of commands that aren't actually gray. They're black and white. The, the obvious ones are the Ten Commandments, right? Those are, those are black and white. Do not and do. Honor God, don't murder, Right? Very clear, very simple. Uh, the Great Commission is a commandment. Go out into all the nations and disciple. Baptize and disciple in my name. 
That's a command. Here's another one that's really working me over right now. Forgive. Forgive. Earlier in Luke, <laughs> earlier in Luke, he talks about if your brother sins against you and comes to you and says, I repent, forgive them. And it says in that particular parable, if he says seven times in a day, I repent, you forgive him every time. And it's not a, you forgive him if he shows his actions are changing. It's not, you wait, you withhold forgiveness until there's a difference. It's not, you need to make sure that he means it when he says repent. It says, if he says, I repent, you forgive. That's a command. And I was like reading that going, well, but no. No, I mean, they have to mean it. You know, Alyssa, trust me, Alyssa's heard this from me all the time. She goes, I'm sorry. And I go, you know, I don't really care. I just need to see a difference. <laughs> I'm good. The, the peanut gallery is giving their opinion. If you can't hear that, they're... Um, I forgive her. But in the moment, that's my reaction. You've hurt me. I need to see a difference. You can say you're sorry till kingdom come. And if there's not a difference, it doesn't count. Guess what? It doesn't matter if it counts. My commandment, if I'm a child of God, is I forgive. And the interesting thing here is a lot of us, like, I can feel it, guys. We're having that glitch. Like, no, 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 they, they have to repent. It doesn't say they have to repent. It says they have to say, I repent. Scary. No, no, they have to change their, their behavior. They have to change their attitude. No. Nope. I have to forgive. And I think a lot of us know when we don't forgive, there's a big issue there. Unforgiveness blocks forgiveness in our lives. And when we are actually able to forgive, that opens the door to forgiveness. You know, before we're broken before the Lord, I, I feel like we're Paul in Romans when he says that he, he continually wants to do what is right but does what is wrong. And when we are finally broken, we're the next chapter where he says, but therefore there's no condemnation in Christ, and he actually beco we become a new creation. Before that, we might know the way to go, but we're wild, and we might go that way and we might not. And sometimes when we want, we still have these inclinations we don't. God comes in and he breaks us, and suddenly the door is wide open to his grace in our life. And I challenge you guys to really... Part for me, the process right now of getting broken is the Lord is revealing all the commandments and then he's revealing all the places that I balk at the commandment. And, you know, the Ten Commandments seem pretty easy. I've never murdered anybody physically, but then if you also, if you read your Bible, Jesus came along and said, oh, well, those Ten Commandments, that applies to your heart, not just your physical actions. So I might feel good that I've never murdered anyone, and then God says, but are you harboring hatred towards somebody? Because if you've harbored hatred towards somebody, you've murdered them. You're not following my commandments. Is it John who talks about if you love me, how do you know you're a lover of God? You follow his commandments. Jesus said if you love me, you'll follow my commands. How do you know that you have an area of life that is not broken, is not submitted to God? You're not following his commands. And a lot of us, we go, God doesn't place commands. He doesn't demand anything from us. And you know, he does and he doesn't. I, I love it. We say God is not a respecter of persons, but I always hated that term because I look at people that I know in my life and in my own life, and I go, he's respecting their person. He's letting them make really poor decisions. He's letting them continue really bad habits. But at the same time, he loves us too much to leave us where, he, where we are, so he's always constantly doing something in our lives. I don't know what it is for you, but I know that he's constantly chasing and pursuing all of you. He wants all of us submitted. And why does he want all of us submitted? And, and this is the part that is the most exciting. Why are we broken? Well, we're broken so that revival can happen. If you study and read revivals, and, and we have all these statements, and we even have somebody in our in our body that, that got a doctorate on studying revival. And he, he can tell you the three things that, that are present, and there's this travailing prayer that's been there forever, and there's this people willing to sacrifice. But what it is, it's people broken before God. 
broken for something, that they say, no matter what, whatever it takes, whatever thing I need to do, I want you, and not just I want you here, I want you in my world. I want you to change what's the culture that's going on there because revival isn't, in my opinion, true revival changes culture. And it's really funny, Charlie last week talked about the divided gospel, how sometimes we we, we can get stuck and we preach the gospel of individual salvation, which is just about yourself. And then sometimes we, we can get we mature out of that and we preach the gospel of the kingdom, which is doing the work of the kingdom. But tr- the true gospel is the gospel of the king. And it's about being in a loving, amazing, submitted relationship with our creator, with our father. And that's the true understanding of the gospel. I think we do the same thing with the idea of revival. We've divided it where a lot of people, when, when you actually talk about revival, the main thing they say is soul, soul winning, soul winning, soul winning. So they'll talk about we had a revival and oh, what happened? Well, people came and they got saved and it's like, and that's it. And the church was really rocking for a bit and people came and got saved. And it's really funny, the renewal doesn't necessarily get called within a renewal because it didn't necessarily have that salvation aspect in it. So it got kind of historically called renewal, the Toronto blessing was the renewal, not a revival, because it was lacking that, that you see in a lot of revivals. And I think that's then the renewal introduces this second level of revival that sometimes people get, which is, you know, I get really, I, I manifest, and the Lord is there at, at, at the church service I went to, and I fell on the floor, or I received this healing, or I received that, and and that's wonderful and that's awesome. Just like personal salvation is amazing and awesome. These aren't something we ignore or don't go after. But if you get hit by the Lord and you're on the floor vibrating for an hour and you get up and you go out into the world and nothing changes, that's not revival. That's spiritual stimulation. You see, revival in its fullest form is I get saved. I have a personal revival. I get hit by the power of God and I'm on the floor for an hour and when I wake when I wake up when I get up I leave this room changed I have a calling I have a purpose and suddenly the culture that I go into starts being transformed that's the full understanding but we don't get that full understanding until we break ourselves until we we submit ourselves and we say lord anything and everything you need I will do I will give I want revival. I want people saved. I want a rocking church, and I want my culture transformed. I think we need to shift our attention from activity in the church as the end point and the goal. And we need to see, we need to transition all that to the world. That what happens in a church setting, what happens when I'm in a community and the Spirit of God falls, is all geared towards affecting my community. And if you look at the gospel, if you look at, 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 at how Jesus trained, that is what it is. He took people that were hurting, he taught them, he trained them, and then he sent them out. I'm pretty sure the Spirit was falling when Jesus was teaching. I'm pretty sure the disciples were experiencing the Holy Spirit. And I'm, I'm sure many more times than we see in the Bible, they had amazing uh, times where the Spirit was moving and Jesus was teaching. But I think it's important that we don't hear about those. They're not listed clearly in the gospel anywhere. Because the main point of doing that was you get healed and you get trained so you get sent out. But what happens, I think, is we have this level where we don't get broken enough that we actually say, yes, take me out of my discomfort. Take me out of my discomfort other way. Take me into my discomfort. Take me out of my comfort zone. You know, we've, I've said this for years. Charlie has said this for years. The church should not be a safe place. If you consider safe, nobody gets hurt. Nobody gets offended. Nobody gets, um, you know, nobody feels uncomfortable. The church shouldn't be a safe place. If that is what the church is, then I think that as leaders in the church, we're doing our job wrong. The church should be a safe place in the way that training wheels on a bike make the bike safer. You're still on a bike. You can still go very fast. You can still fall off. It doesn't protect you from every injury. It's a necessary aid until you get strong enough, until you get your balance to be on the bike on your own. Same thing with pads and a helmet. It won't protect you 100%. It protects you enough 
for you to do some really cool stuff on a bike. Church is the same way. If we aren't challenging you, we're failing. If we aren't pushing you out of your comfort zone, we're failing. And that starts with us. If we aren't allowing ourselves as leaders to get pushed out of our comfort zone, we're failing. If we aren't allowing ourselves to be challenged, we're failing. But I think part of this brokenness that, that we need to get to is this, uh, this changing of the dynamic that I need to stop finding havens, safe havens away from the world. And I need to start being aware that I am not of the world, but I'm in it. And I think Christianity has forgotten that in many ways as we've become more insular and we've more focused on what happens in the walls. We've forgotten the whole in the world part. We're actually in the world. We're not supposed to hide away from it. We're supposed to transform it. If I see something I don't like in the world, I'm actually empowered by the Lord to go and make a difference in that area. But a lot of us don't do it for a lot of reasons that all land under this banner of we're unbroken. We are wild and we want to go our own way. And the way that the, to, to circle back to the beginning, the way the religious spirit and the way that the political spirit interacts with that is it tells us and gives us justification for us going our own way. It starts blocking that communication with God. It starts numbing that conviction of the Lord so that I can go my own way. And it starts giving me community with people that believe what I do so I'm never challenged by it. And we see it all the time. I've been in church. I've gone to four main churches in my life. I've seen it at every church I go to. And I just, like I said, I say, Lord, what's the solution? And he says, you need to be broken. And I just feel like he's saying, I want to break you, but it will be sweet. Not that it won't be uncomfortable, but it will be sweet. I'll hold your hand every step of the way. I'll show you where you're going. That makes the, the momentary discomfort worth it. And he's saying it to me, and he's saying it to you. And so I just pray right now, Father, I just pray that you would begin to show these areas of our life that we have built up resistance. Show us these areas of life that we've partnered with a spirit that isn't yours. Show us these areas of life that we've allowed hurts to create a block. Show us these areas of life that we are wild and we go our own way. And Father, show us your love and give us your grace that we, be, we can begin with you addressing these areas. Father, I just repent of the areas in my life that I am wild and I want to go my own way. Father, I invite you into those areas right now. I ask you to break me. I just pray that you guys can do the same thing. I pray, Father, for your conviction on us all that it becomes uncomfortable to stay where we are. I thank you that you chase after us, that you're never content until you have all of us. And more than anything, Father, I just pray for your love to invade our space. That we understand that at, at any point, your love is the thing that is motivating us. Your love for us and your love for this world. And we thank you for that. May we never lose sight of your love. In Jesus' name, amen. As many of you know, I rarely, rarely do this, but I really felt led this time just to come and respond to Miko's message. It was so powerful. You can stand up. What's it? You can stand up too. It was really good. It had to be really good. Lori smacked my thigh twice while he was preaching. And so, okay. Hello, world. Ho! Oh, so um, I just want to respond a little bit to what Miko was saying. It was a huge word of encouragement for this season. Uh, I also want to add... Jesus did teach on the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod, but there was a third leaven that Jesus taught on as well, and it's Luke 13, 21. Jesus taught on the leaven of the kingdom. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, we don't want to be a part of a political spirit, and we don't want to be a part of a religious spirit, but 
when we come carrying the values, carrying the ways of the kingdom of God, we become the leaven in that culture that irresistibly cannot help but affect the whole lump. So in that passage, it talks about a woman putting a little leaven in a lump and giving it time, and in time, the entire lump is affected. And those are our neighborhoods. Those are our relatives. That, those are, that's our area of influence. So I want to encourage you, focus on the power that the Lord has put in you to know true forgiveness, the leaven of forgiveness. When you release somebody from an offense, the freedom they feel, the impact that has, that's the leaven of the kingdom. When you learn to walk in true humility, we know God opposes the proud, but it gives grace to the humble When you walk in confidence, not in yourself, but confidence in your God, when you get a vision of how extreme his love is, how completely sufficient his presence is to be with you in every circumstance, you affect, infect the entire culture around you. So, Father, I just thank you for Miko's message. I thank you for the blessing that he prayed, and I just come into agreement. And, Lord, we want to focus not on the negative things that are happening, but on the positive things that you're doing, the leaven of your kingdom, God. Let it continue to increase in our life and affect and infect everything and everyone around us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. Have a good week.